We are very <clears throat> honored uh, today to, to have uh, our dear guest, uh, Professor Ted Hopf from the National University of Singapore. Uh, <clears throat> Ted is an old friend of our university. He's a member of a consultative board of our two departments. Uh, and of course, well, uh, <clears throat> he doesn't even really need uh, uh, an introduction as a political scientist because he's such a uh, an important uh, 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 dominating figure in the field of international relations and particularly within this one of the major subfields or, or uh, let's say uh, schools of thought within international relations that the social so-called social constructivism uh, represents uh, so um, uh, Ted uh, famously <clears throat> applied uh, the uh, uh, well the methods that are, that look maybe uncommon to, to many such as the analysis of uh, popular culture uh, literature uh, 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 in the uh, major countries during the Cold War and now comes closer to our time. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, based on these uh, on the on these books on the on these cultural documents, he reconstructed the identity or the uh, identity that comes to the state leaders from below, and that, according to him, frames in many ways the behavior uh, determines the outcomes of the international uh, conflicts and international uh, negotiations. So this is a, a combination of a very uh, strong theoretical platform that uh, uh, Ted uh, explored in detail in the uh, book uh, 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 that is called The Social Construction of International Politics. Uh, and uh, a very thorough and uh, large-scale empirical work of which I... Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, I have just uh, uh, told you what it is about, uh, uh, but it combined the qualitative and quantitative methods. It uh, uh, expanded from the 50s from, uh, now to what to, to the 60s to the, to the 60s. So the, the story continues. I'm moving on. Um, uh, so maybe we'll come to the 90s before I die eventually. But I, there are some other people who who help with, with the more recent developments. Uh, it's actually a, big, a huge uh, uh, team project, a part of, of which Ted is a leader. So you can consult, uh, apart from this theoretical book, the book on the reconstructing the Cold War, the early years, the major accomplishment um, in this empirical uh, aspect. Uh, and uh, apart from this, Ted is really a very broadly minded intellectual, a global inter intellectual who covers the entire world all the time in his flights, in, in, <laughs> probably in, in the flight of his thought too. So being actually a specialist on uh, Russia originally, he, I mean, we have all to learn from him because he, starting from Russia, he actually built a global theory and now he can even explain to us the politics of China. <laughs> which is not something that probably he would uh, imagine um, uh, um, developing like 30 years ago. So uh, without further ado, I just give the floor to our uh, uh, orator, uh, to the speaker, and uh, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Artyom. Yes, as Artyom, for the very broad-minded introduction. Um, as our, as our chum said, uh, I've been rel related to EUSP for many years. Uh, it's almost a, my 20th anniversary. I was here on 9-11 in 2001. My first day teaching was 9-11, in fact, in uh, 2001. Um, and I've been coming back, I guess, five or six times since at least. Uh, obviously, whenever I come to Russia, I make sure I come here uh, as well. 
Um, what I want to talk about today is a kind of a multi-pronged project, but let's start with what, why do we care? Well, everyone who does international relations theory wants to know um, how to um, imagine the rise of China, right? What are the consequences of the rise of China for global order? Uh, and we have many different perspectives on this. Um, those who adopt a more materialist perspective, uh, especially the varieties of realism that exist, hegemonic, tra hegemonic transition theory, uh, power transition theory, Organsky and Kugler, um, are very, very pessimistic. Right? They expect the rise of China to lead to conflict with the uh, current hegemon in the United States uh, for the obvious reason that the U.S. doesn't want to lose its position. And China, of course, is dissatisfied with the distribution of global resources. And I mean that not just in terms of material resources, but in terms of status, privilege, uh, law, norms, and so forth. I mean, as Bob Gilpin wrote, good God, 30 years ago in War and Change International Politics, where he surveyed um, all the hegemonic wars since um, the Peloponnesian Wars, um, very often the cause of the war ultimately is the rising power feels that the current distribution of status, normative order, is uh, unjust. Right? It doesn't satisfy them. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, predominant hegemon of the time thinks that uh, it's premature to start redistributing those goods. Uh, and either you end up with the rising hegemon going to war uh, against the hegemon, or you have the hegemon fighting a preventive war against the rising power. And more recently, we have, um, I mean, all of the, the book, Thucydides' Trap by Graham Allison, is you know, mostly wrong. Uh, the data that he gathers on the previous cases of hegemonic transition is not wrong. That is, 11 out of the 13 previous transitions since uh, the Peloponnesian Wars has ended up in a hegemonic war. Um, what are the two exceptions? Uh, the two exceptions are actually quite, well, one of them at least is quite um, informative for our current, today's discussion. Uh, so the first uh, hegemonic transition without war was between Britain and the United States. Uh, where essentially uh, Britain handed off to the United States hegemony in 1944-45. Right? And the reason we don't even think about it is because the order that the U.S. created was quite consonant with how the U.K. had run affairs, with the, with the exception of compelling decolonization, uh, that is, compelling uh, Britain to give up their imperial preference, that is, allowing U.S. multinational and capital to uh, exploit the developing world as much as the UK had, uh, there is very little difference uh, between the UK order and the US order. Uh, and then, of course, the um, second uh, case of non-conflict between a rising hegemon and a hegemon is the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, the Soviet Union was rising, and yet there was no war. Why? Well, I mean, the easy answer, and I think the correct answer, is nuclear weapons. There was a strategic standoff between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. They never came close to a fighting war. Um, lest we forget, we call it the Cold War, but the Cold War was not cold. There are 20 million deaths during the Cold War. It just so happens that uh, you know, 19 million, 900,000 of them were not Soviet or Americans. Right? They were Angolans, Mozambicans, Vietnamese, Cambodians. Right? They were the, basically the peoples of the decolonizing world uh, who were slaughtered in wars uh, which were basically ways in which the U.S. and the Soviet Union acted out its great, pile, great power rivalry short of nuclear war. Which brings us to the current rise of China. Right? Well, on the one hand, we can say, well, you know, it's unlikely that China and the U.S. will get into a shooting war because, you know, they both have mutually assured destruction. Um, but that's not, you know, that's just, you know, wow, thank God for that, right? But that isn't very uh, encouraging for the rest of the world, where the U.S. and China can easily end up in even worse situations than the U.S. and Soviet Union. Why? Well, because during the Cold War, at least, the Soviet Union had virtually zero, zero material interests in the developing world. 
It was more or less self-sufficient in all raw materials except bauxite from Guinea <laughs> and Jamaica. Right. China, as we well know, is a huge importer of raw materials. Right. So on top of the reputational stakes that great powers with nuclear weapons always have in the developing world, there are also now material stakes. Uh, that does not bode well for conflict between uh, the US and China, ultimately. But as Archelm pointed out, I mean, according to um, the um, survey, that I guess it's, uh, it's not annual, it's pretty frequent, the survey done by uh, the people at William and Mary, I can't remember the name of what it's called now, anyway, they survey about 1,100, 1,200 IR scholars around the world every two, three, four years, including in Russia and China, U.S., Latin America, so forth and so on. Uh, constructivism is now you know, the third major school of IR thought taught to undergrads and graduate students around the world, including in China, uh, along with realisms and liberalism. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, constructivism has not generated uh, much in the terms of attacking this question of the rise of China uh, and hegemonic transition in general. So a few years ago, uh, in fact, I gave this presentation at EUSP maybe eight years ago, where I trotted out China? no, my, where I trotted out my version of common sense constructivism, where I married neo Gramscian accounts of hegemony to constructivism uh, and applied it to um, uh, to uh, the world capitalist order. Uh, and it's actually focused on Russia. It was an international organization article for 2012. Um, but at any rate, so uh, with the exception of that, really, so what this, what this work is, this, this work takes the 2012 article's theoretical framework, which is a neo gramscian constructive theory of hegemonic transition, and applies it to China, the China-U.S. transition today. Um, and... That's what today's talk is about, but I want to give you a sense of what the, the whole project is, is this. So we've created a Making Identity Account database um, whose ambition is to gather um, the national identities of all great powers from 1810 to the present at 10-year intervals. So it'll be a uh, kind of an ideational analog to correlates of war. So correlates of war gathers all the materialist variables. Uh, but the master variable of constructivism is national identity. And national identity has never been operationalized in a systematic way. And we do that in this project. Uh, we have a common method. Uh, and the first product is this making identity count volume, edited by myself and Bentley Allen. Um, which covers all the BRICS, plus the UK, France, Germany, um, the US, of course, uh, and Japan, and Italy. Not Italy's on the book, but it's been added. Uh, for just one year, 2010. And because uh, no university press would ever publish an edited volume of national identity reports, uh, we animated the book uh, by test driving uh, this neo Gramscian constructive account of hegemonic transition, uh, which ended up producing the uh, International Organization article for 2018 uh, called uh, The Distribution of Identity uh, and the Rise of China. And uh, so this is that project. Right? Here are the countries we're doing for, for that project from. Uh, in 2010. Now we've gone back to 1950, and at 10-year intervals done each of these countries. Um, Slava Morozov is in charge of the Soviet Union and Russia in this project, and then other individuals are in charge of other countries. Uh, believe it or not, I'm in charge of China, which, you know, which just means finding people in China or who know Chinese to actually do the reports. I don't do the reports by, myself. So the uh, Bentley Allen, who was my co-author of the Make an Identity Count book, and Serge Vucetic, who um, is uh, my 
my co-author in this uh, article, that, this draft that I'm presenting to you today, uh, was responsible for the UK. Um, so what were, the, what were the findings in that book for our first 2010 volume? Well, we we're trying to figure out how much support is there in the world in 2010 for Western democratic neoliberal hegemony. So we're defining hegemony in terms of just two aspects at first, type of governance, you know, democratic versus authoritarianism, and neoliberal in terms of how free market uh, the economy is understood to be. Now, it's related to national identity in the following way. We do discourse analysis of a variety of texts, ranging from elite texts to mass texts. The elite texts are the speeches of the political elite, um, the uh, high school history textbooks for that country, and the opinion editorials in the top two most circulated newspapers for that country. And the mass texts are the letters to the editor to those same two newspapers, plus the top two best-selling novels and the top um, two most attended movies. Of course, these are all indigenous production, right? And by doing discourse analysis on these, we find out how do people understand themselves as German or Germany? What is Germany? How do you understand what it means to be German? Um, so the national identity reports that result actually have dozens of identity categories. And those are all reported in the Making Identity Count volume, right? But for the purpose of this presentation, and for the purpose of the articles that I've suggested, we're just going to concentrate on the two central um, pillars of Western hegemony, namely neoliberalism and democracy. Um, so let's, this is going to ultimately become a table with four columns. Uh, but here, this is just the first column. So here's how elites in each of these countries understands Western constitutional democracy as part of their own national identity. And as you see immediately, Russia and China are the only two countries whose elites understand their countries as anti-democratic, anti-Western democratic. Now, every country understands itself as democratic, mm. right? People's Democratic Republic of Korea, right? But we're not concerned with the word democratic. We're, considered, we're concerned with the content, the meaning and how do you measure of the word democratic. Well, how the democracy is described within the discourse. So for example, Russian elite discourse in 2010, um, there are plenty of uh, speeches by Putin, Medvedev, Serkov, and others, and you can go down the line of various Russian political elites who directly contend that Russia is not a Western democracy. Instead, it's a, it's a well, we know the word, right? It's a sovereign democracy, and it has certain features that are incompatible with Western democracy and should be, right? Now, some of them, I'm not going to go, I can't go into detail of each country, but in the Russian case, um, at some points in time, Putin and Rivetov will say that, well, we, ultimately we will become that. But don't rush us. Right? We're young, we're early. Uh, we're, we're still developing. In fact, developing is one of the major, most sound identity categories in Russian discourse of national identity. That we're a developing country. We're a developing democracy, right? And then Brazil, Brazilian elites are mixed with respect to democracy because there's still an understanding of the benefits of military dictatorship, right? And a more dirigiste central power. But on the other hand, every other elite understands their country as democratic in this list. So if this is the only thing we knew would go, wow, this is a pretty robust support for Western hegemony with the exceptions of Russia and China. What about masses? Well, masses are even more supportive of democracy than elites are. Uh, Brazil, for sure. Russia should really be plus minus. Sorry about that, because there's ambivalence among Russian mass texts. But China, China mass texts are negative about Western democracy. You know, too much disorder, too much lawlessness. Um, not enough predictability. Right? But in general, looking at these largest countries in the world, um, on the democratic side, at least, there's a, a large degree of support for um, democratic identity as being part of my own national identity. How about neoliberalism? Well, neoliberalism is more mixed, right? And what's, 
Let's talk about France, because France is the only country whose elite does not understand its country as capitalist. Not only isn't it capitalist, but it shouldn't be, <laughs> right? It should be a social welfareist. It should be redistributive. It should have a, um, it should have a, you know, a, a, a market with a human face. That's right, how I would put it. So wherever you see these negatives coming before the positive, it means that within the elites, there's more sympathy for being anti-neoliberal than being pro-neoliberal. And the only two countries that are pro-neoliberal -neo, pro in, to, in toto in 2010 are Russia and the UK. <laughs> right. Now, a lot, of the data, a lot of the data for this is most evident in my 2012 I.O. article. So if you want to see all the speeches and texts and so forth and so on. Um, but even so, I mean, in terms of being negative first, the U.S. The U.S. is basically just split down the middle. 2010, of course, Obama's in power, and the U.S. Uh, polity is split, much as it is today. And the U.S. elites are split, much as they are today, uh, and the same with Japan. So, I mean, there's no. So, in terms of just, we are neoliberal, U.K. Russia, or we should be neoliberal, U.K. Russia, and we aren't and shouldn't be France. Those are the only. Uh, clear pluses and minuses, right? The rest are all ambivalent about neoliberalism. So this is not a finding that should make us think that Western hegemony is robust. It's not. It's under threat, right? It's even more under threat if we look at the masses. The masses are far more negative about neoliberalism or capitalism being part of their national identity than the elites are. Right? There are no masses who understand their country national identity as being neoliberal or capitalist. None, right? There's some who think it's more than, but none, there's no, there's no solid plus, right? So this gives us an interesting kind of snapshot of 2010. What's, what's the state of Western hegemony in 2010? Well, it's very robust on the governance side, but very shaky and under threat on the economic side, right? Um, now, one caveat that's very important. This is 2010. That's only two years into the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. So you might expect people to be pretty, pretty pissed off about how the market's been treating them, right? Uh, but I can, you know, to, to fast forward, we, we've done 2015 now. 2015 looks a lot like this, right? There is much, very little change in uh, negative attitudes toward being capitalist or being free market. And uh, still, much great support for uh, social welfareism. Now, the second conclusion to draw from this is notice that China is, you know, basically offering authoritarian neoliberalism. The U.S. is offering democratic neoliberalism. But where are the masses? There is actually a hegemonic ideology out there, and it's called social democracy, right? Social welfareism, that's the hegemonic ideology that exists in the world in 2010, I would say 2015 as well. And if I had to speculate, I'd say 2020 as well. I mean, people want a democratic market with the human face. You know, a democratic redistributive market. I mean, that's, that's how they, that's like the commonsensical way they understand what like a, a just, normal society should be like, right? But there's no concentration of material power in the world to empower that hegemonic ideology. Now, if Europe were a state, perhaps we could talk about a European hegemonic challenge as the U.S. and China, but we can't. Right. So, it's a in the article in the I.O. article in 2018, we argue that this is one of the you know this is a very interesting finding in the sense that you know China's material power is rising, but its ide ideology, how it understands itself, is an obstacle to ever becoming hegemonic, because authoritarianism only resonates with Russia. <laughs> Uh, which is not enough to mount a challenge to uh, all the rest of the countries combined. Okay, so this is where we, you know, we stopped in 2010 with this. Um, and as I said before, we've gone back to 1950, and 50, 60, 70, 89, blah, 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 right? And we'll go on into 2020, when I can raise the money. Uh, do 2020, 2025, et cetera, right? We'll see how this plays itself out. Um, there are court, there is one, I mean, okay. So one of the um, 
theorist of hegemonic transition is uh, Bill Wolforth, uh, a neorealist at Dartmouth, who in 1999 wrote an international security article called um, something like, uh, you know, why, unipar why Unipolarity Will Last in 99. Um, to be sure, his deadline was 30 years, so we're getting close to 2029 when he thought that, you know, it might be on its last legs. But he made one really, really interesting observation uh, about Western hegemony by what he meant U.S., Western Europe, Japan, U.S. and Western Europe, right? Namely that as China rises, um, most likely to occur from a realist perspective is regional balancing against China, right? That as China rises, that its danger will be felt first by countries in its neighborhood, not by the U.S. and Western Europe. And Bill Wolfer said, this is, a, this is a great thing for Western hegemony because the West needs to just sit back and watch as China gets balanced against by its neighbors, right? And at most, all the U.S. and Western Europe has to do is sell weapons, <laughs> right? Which is exactly what the U.S. and Western Europe are doing uh, as we sit here today. So having, you know, having Bill Wolforth in mind, and also because I'm sitting in Singapore, in Asia, um, we expanded our project to look at the distribution of identity in Asia. So we're kind of like testing or applying the previous theoretical framework of Neo-Gramscian constructivism, as well as taking up Wolfworth's kind of realist hypothesis that China's neighbors are going to balance against China. Right? Now, we did one other thing. Uh, that we could have done, but didn't, in the I.O. article and in the Making Identity Account book, namely, um, go far more deeply into what the national identities are of each of these countries. Because as, as I said, we kind of artificially uh, made neoliberalism and democracy, plus or minus, right, uh, the most salient parts of every country's national identity. They are not. They are not, right? So for example, the single most salient identity category for Germany in 2010 is the Holocaust, right? It's this German historical other, this negative German historical other against which it's constantly understanding itself. That was easily the most salient identity category for Germany in 2010, not being democratic or capitalist, right? But we, we, we kind of extracted where democracy and capitalism were in order to test our theorization of, of Western hegemony. Well, in this distribution of identity in Asia project, we wanted to actually take more seriously um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, how we conceptualize discourse of national identity and pay far more attention to uh, the national identity categories that are most salient, even if they have nothing to do with democracy or um, economic order, and then compare that to China's discourse of national identity, right? So here are the countries. Don't ask me uh, to relate them to the flags, but <laughs> basically it's all of ASEAN, plus uh, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, although Taiwan and Hong Kong aren't presented here. Um, and you're gonna see there's missing data, so I apologize for not having a completed paper, because I don't. Uh, and, there's gonna, and there's gonna be a missing country, because, and this actually goes to some of the problems of doing this research. Laos is missing. And the reason why Laos is missing is that it's just too dangerous to do the research in Laos. So I had a research collaborator in Laos um, who started to do the work until when she went to the library to take out some novels, she had her visa confiscated because they told her, your visa has nothing to do with reading novels. So it was scary. Also, she realized that mass texts in Laos are, of course, heavily censored, but she knew that there's a whole cultural underground in Laos uh, producing plays and uh, songs and poetry readings and so forth and so on that she has access to that she would never, ever, ever report on publicly because then these people's lives would be threatened. Right? She doesn't want to expose this this mass text of Laotian national identity. Uh, so for, for purely ethical reasons, um, we abandoned Dewey Laos.
it was just too dangerous, not just for her, the researcher, but also for her, her um, interlocutors in Laos. So, first let me present the neoliberal democracy stuff for these 12 countries in 2015, notice, and then I'll dig more deeply into um, the national identity categories for these countries and what those implications are for Chinese hegemony, right? not just neoliberal democracy. So, um, start again with these, um, the same um, table, right? So once again, again, with the exception of China, Vietnam, Singapore, and partially Russia in 2015, um, democracy is understood as part of one's national identity. But it does give you more variance than in the BRICS plus the great powers, right? Uh, so Vietnam is explicitly, con Vietnam, like China, like Singapore, um, explicitly rejects Western constitutional democracy. I mean, they reject it even being democratic or as being a form of democracy that's appropriate to the country, right? And Russia has, uh, Russian elite in 2015 at least is ambivalent, well, ambivalent in a negative sense, right? But all the rest understand, you know, Western, neo Western uh, constitutional democracy as what they should be, right? Even if they're not it yet. So Indonesian elites, I mean, they recognize that they're in a very, very problematic democracy, but they would like to be more democratic. They'd like to be more like Denmark. Um, then you see some blank spots. Well, Laos is, is of course blank, right? Um, and it probably will be dropped completely because I can't see how we're going to sustain it. What about masses? Well, masses are even more positive, except for all these absences. Why are these things absent? Well, we don't know why they're absent. We can't explain the absence. This just shows that democratic identity is not part of one's salient national identity in these countries. So Chinese, Chinese novels and movies don't address whether or not China is democratic or authoritarian. This doesn't come up, right? Um, so you might think, oh, well, they know, they're, they're afraid to talk about it. Well, then that doesn't explain South Korea. I mean, South Koreans shouldn't be afraid to think of themselves as democratic, which then raises the alternative explanation. Oh, it's so taken for granted, it's never mentioned. And we don't have the tools at the level of discourse analysis to give an answer what absence means. Right, so we just leave it blank. We, and we're not going to speculate as to, as to what it might mean. Uh, importantly, with the exception of Singapore and Russia, those countries who, those masses who do understand their country, do understand uh, in a salient way whether or not the country is democratic or not, do understand their countries as democratic, or aspirationally so. Only Russians and Singaporeans in general reject a Western constitutional democracy as part of their identity, although they're ambivalent about it. All right. But this gives, if we just stop here for a second, um, this hints, right? It hints at the possibility of um, Vietnam, China, Russia, Singapore uh, forming you know, some kind of hegemonic community where they do understand governance in similar ways. Let's go to the neoliberalism side. Um, looks very, very much like 2010, except even more positive than 2010, right? Those are those other great powers, uh, in the sense that there are no there are no Frances in this list, mm -hmm. right? And very importantly, I mean, many of these countries are quite poor, <laughs> and yet they and they but they understand their way out of poverty as being neoliberal export orientation, attracting foreign investment. Because I'm sure, before, when I'm done, I'm sure some, one of you is going to ask, what's neoliberalism? And the answer is, in each country, it's different. But there are certain common features in each country. Low taxation, low regulation, uh, export-oriented economy, competitive markets, real currency, real prices, um, and of course, low uh, inflation. Low inflation. Yeah, this this orthodoxy, right? Um, and the fact is that I mean, you, here, here's Vietnam, who we've already established is anti-democratic, and yet it's the, the elites are, on the whole, uh, neoliberal, as are all the other elites here. 
And the minus that comes after the plus just means, oh, there should be more redistribution. There, I mean, these, these discourses recognize the negative externalities of the market. Uh, in many of these countries, it's pollution and congestion. Like Vietnam, it's congestion and bad air, right? In South Korea, it's corruption and um, maldistribution of income. Right? So in each one of these countries, because of the National Indemnity Reports being sufficiently detailed, we can actually go in and see what makes a country have a negative attitude toward being neoliberal. Being the right. Same thing with democracy. So if I, if, I, if I spent some time on the Singaporean case, I could tell you how um, you know, Singaporean TV, show, TV shows uh, depict the negative aspects of being democratic. Uh, like absurd. For example, one is the absurdly long time it takes to build a metro in Germany. Right. Whereas in, in Singapore, we have a government who has, our, has national interests at heart. When we build our metros, we build them you know, fast efficiently, economically. In fact, you know, I can say this, that the 20-year master plan for Singapore is to have a metro or a bus stop within 10 minutes of every single door in Singapore. Right? And they don't have to worry about zoning. They don't have to worry about rights of way. They don't have to worry about anything that democracy would bring. And this is this, is this uh, negative view towards democracy among Singapore masses. Like, democracy makes it hard to get things done. Right? And you know, as, as an American, like, we never think of it that way. Well, at least I don't think of it that way, right? I'm, I'm, I'm completely socialized differently. So, anyway, so what, what's the bottom line? Let's, if we stop just with this, we more or less, you know, get this. We more or less um, end up with a you know a thin version of Chinese hegemony with just you know a handful of countries, right? Uh, China, Singapore, Russia. Um, you would think Vietnam. Uh, and that's it. Right? So in that sense, if, if we, and I don't want to do this, but I'll do it just for simplicity's sake, if we were to take Bill Wolfhard's hypothesis and say, well, yeah, I mean, most countries would balance against China's rise, right? Because their hegemonic project is incompatible with their own national identities, right? So I, I haven't made this argument yet, and I'm not sure I will make it, but, you know, the argument is out there that I mean, what, what a constructivist would say is, I'll tell you who's going to balance against a rising China, if you tell me what China's hegemonic ideology is and what the predominant discourse of national identity are in any given country. And if that discourse of national identity resonates with, is compatible with, has an affinity with China's hegemonic project, then that country will not balance. That would be like the hard, strong, constructivist hypothesis. Right? And to the extent it's incompatible, they will balance. So we make some kind of bold predictions. I mean, most people think Vietnam's going to balance against China. Right? If you look at like the hard thing, the, like the material thing, well, they're on, they share a border, right? They've had conflict in the past. They've had territorial disputes. Well, those three things I could say about Russia and China today, right? They share a very long border. They've had disputes in the past. They've had territorial disputes in the past. Right? They're contiguous to each other. From a realist perspective, Russia should be balancing against China. And there's no realist argument out there for, uh, that would think that a, a contiguous rising hegemon would have Russia as a friend. Right? But this ideational story that I'm telling says, well, they will be, they will be part of Chinese hegemony. Because they actually understand their own identity in compatible terms. Right? All right, so I didn't... I want to fulfill my promise to go more deeply into at least, oh, I'm sorry, the mass neoliberalism. Mass. Yeah, the mass neoliberalism. So again, the same kind of negative attitude toward neoliberalism that we get in the, uh, the BRICS plus the Great Powers in 2010, with the exception of Myanmar. Myanmar masses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Indian masses, Cambodian masses, I'm sorry, I can't see very well. Myanmar and Singapore are the most positive about capitalism as being part of their national identity. Okay, so let's go more deeply. Uh, here's an example of a deep dive into a national identity report. So here we see that, this is Indonesia, 2015, right? Well, we see that democratic is only their third most salient identity category, all right? Uh, but 
it's still positive. What's the most important ethnic category? Being Muslim. Indonesians are Muslims. Indonesia is a Muslim country. Both elites and mass texts say that about Indonesia. Um, I'm not going to work through all of these, uh, but just to look at the mass side, if you start with the uh, pro-poor, exploited by corporations, economically unequal, environmentally degraded, these are all rejections of neoliberalism. Um, and of course, very high is being a developing country. <clears throat> now, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, I'm not sure I'm going to end, but I'll give some time for questions. So, what I did was, what we did was, you know, we went through all the countries. I know this is a very, uh, this has too many words on it, this slide. But this is kind of like a snapshot summary of, um, what are the obstacles to Chinese hegemony in the region based upon identity categories, and what are the opportunities? So we start with the Philippines, Cambodia, Indonesia understand themselves as corrupt. And that's a negative identity for them. So to the extent that China also understands itself as corrupt, it doesn't make China a very attractive hegemonic coalition partner, if you want to call it that. So China being corrupt is an obstacle to hegemony. Um, Religion. So both Indonesia and Malaysia understand themselves as Muslim countries. That doesn't sit too well with current Chinese anti-Muslim practices. Myanmar and Cambodia understand themselves as Buddhist countries, which doesn't sit too well with China's current anti-religious practices. Right? So that's another obstacle. And Indonesia, like some of America's Trump supporters, identify against communism, as if communism is a current, a current threat to the Indonesian way of life. That doesn't help China hegemonically with respect to Indonesians. And kind of, you know, least interesting for me, but of course important for the, the prediction is both Philippines and Myanmar elites and masses understand China as a hostile country. Right? So obviously this is like this direct prediction of balancing against China. So these are obstacles. But it also, the identity discourse will also reveal opportunities. So, as you can see, a, a broad range of countries understands Japan as that imperial, occupying, colonizing, rapacious power of 70 years ago. This gives China an opportunity. To the extent that, to the extent that China can cultivate right, that image of Japan in the hearts and minds of these peoples and sustain it, and that gives them an opportunity. Uh, similarly, with respect to the United States, um, you know, if I had to summarize in brief Jap Japanese, South Korean, and Philippine elite and mass attitudes to the United States, it's that the U.S. is a necessary evil. Right? Thank God the U.S. is there because it protects us from China. On the other hand, we really wish the U.S. that we didn't need the U.S. to protect us from China. Right? We prefer if the U.S. would go home. Right? We really don't want the U.S. in our country. Um, and this gives an opportunity to China. If China ha had a, if China had a, uh, a soft sell policy rather than a policy aimed at grabbing land, right, in the South China Sea, I mean, they've, they've undermined this possibility. But again, in theory, they could adopt a policy that would, you know, um, ingratiate themselves with Japanese, South Koreans, and Philippines against the United States instead of taking a hard line. Um, a collection of countries identify themselves as developing. We all know that China understands itself as a developing country and also a rising great power and also as you know, modernizing and so forth. But to the extent it gets other countries to understand, oh, we together. Now, I'm not, I don't know that, you know, I don't know how much time I'm going to spend on it. Um, if you look at China's voting record, the UN General Assembly, it votes as a block with developing countries. Um, the US and Russia in general vote against developing countries. Um, in terms of redistribution of economic resources, but China still maintains its uh, um, its affinity with that. Now they, and these same countries share anti-colonial identities against other colonial powers. Of course, China, Vietnam, Laos all understand itself as socialist countries. Um, South Korea understands itself as one Korea. Now you can combine that with its ambivalence toward the United States, and that gives China, I mean, what, what would happen if China could promise South Korea reunification? Right. Uh, 
that would drive the United States out. That would make South Korea more um, receptive to Chinese hegemony. Singapore understands itself as ethno-nationally Chinese, which is very interesting because Singapore's elite, na Singapore's elite national identity project is the Soviet and American one of civic nationalism. We're all Singaporean. We're not Chinese. We're not Malay. We're not Tamil. We're Singaporean. You know, we're American. We're Soviet. We're Rosiski. Right? Um, but the masses in Singapore, not just Chinese masses, Malay and Tamil masses too, understand Singapore as Chinese. China understands Singapore as Chinese. Right? To the, to the extent that the Singapore government sees that as a threat. So for example, it's a very interesting diplomatic practice. When Singaporean leaders meet with Chinese leaders, Singaporean leaders insist on speaking only English, despite knowing Mandarin. And they use translators, even though they understand Mandarin. This is deliberate, right? They don't want to be, they, Singapore does not want to be, Singapore elites do not want their country understood as Chinese. Right. Finally, Cambodia identifies against Thailand and Vietnam, again, which gives China an opportunity to be the protector of Cambodia uh, against Thailand and Vietnam. Anyway, this is just a kind of a, a list of stuff, of ideational stuff that China has to either take advantage of or overcome in order to establish regional hegemony. Now, there's a huge caveat here. None of the research that I or any of my collaborators do can tell us um, which of these identity categories will be most salient tomorrow. Because right? after all, we know elites are very good at mobilizing a single identity category Right, in order to you know justify or enhance their rule. So when I when I gave this talk a, a week ago at uh, Vishka, um, uh, a China special, <laughs> it's funny, a, chi a China specialist in the audience pointed out to me. He said that you know if you gave me like a small amount of money, access to the presidential administration in Russia, I could turn Russian mass understandings of China into a virulently anti-Chinese uh, position in one month. <laughs> you know, I just flood Russian media with anti-Chinese memes and stories and propaganda and so forth. And within a month, you'd have, you know, Russians frothing against China. Mm -hmm. right? And I thought, that's probably not untrue. Right? I mean, elites do have the capacity, especially in authoritarian countries, to whip up quite a bit of vitriol. Now, I would, you know, as a scholar, I would not understand that as mass understandings of uh, Russian national identity vis-a-vis -vis China. I'd understand it as what it, what it looks like, right? Because I wouldn't see, I mean, until, that, until those kind of representations of China make it into movies and novels and so forth, I would not consider it to be part of a mass Russian <coughs> identity. Anyway, so that's a huge caveat. We don't know um, which of these identity categories will become most sound. So it could be the case that you know, let's say in some world, uh, Indonesia decides being developing is a better, is a more useful identity than being Muslim because being developing actually attracts a lot of Chinese foreign investment. Right, so we'll play down the Muslim side. This is pretty, you know, this is pretty, I don't want to say natural, but it, it's, it's kind of apparent in the region. I mean, uh, you'd expect Muslim countries like Malaysia and Indonesia to be constantly attacking China for its treatment of Uyghurs and Hui and other Muslim minorities? No. Very quiet. Right. Um, okay. Um, I won't bother with that. I don't, I, I don't want to do the material relations. Oh, yes. So just in case you're almost wondering where the US and China sit in UN General Assembly voting, we can see that the US in blue is all by itself. Uh, and this is true from 1971 to the present. What are the axes? Huh? The, uh, the axes, the... Uh, uh, what are they? The dimensions. It's a, it's a, it's a, dis it's a distribution of similarity in voting. Hmm. So the only countries that vote with the US are Israel, right? Fiji Islands, Marshall Islands, and it's a tiny kind. And then the bottom cluster is uh, Europe. They also vote similarly to each other. And then on the far left is China. And who votes with China? Belarus and North Korea. 
right? Not even Russia. Russia's over here, Russia's to the left, over here, also kind of by itself. And then, then there's this huge developing country block. So what differentiates them? Um, well, there are, three, there are three issues. Israel, that's why the US is all by itself. And it's the only country that consistently votes with Israel on everything, and against the Palestinians on everything, right? Russia, on the other hand, abstains on Israel and Palestine almost 100% of the time, whereas China consistently votes against Israel, right? And uh, Russia and the U.S. have similar voting on arms control against it, right? Whereas China votes for arms control, right? Um, but that's just a, a rough, yeah. So in terms of our, how do you go backwards? Yeah, in terms of our um, uh, East Asia, uh, Russia's neighbor, uh, Ch Chinese neighbors, uh, I know it's very, very difficult, but oh, you just look at the peaks. You can see there are two, does this thing have a thing? No, it doesn't. Um, the peaks are South Korea and Japan. They, they vote with the United States more than anyone else, but it's still 40%. 40% is the top of that graph with the US. Meanwhile, everyone votes with China. Right? Look at all the countries in the, in the region clustered at the top with China. The two lowest, again, are South Korea and Japan. I don't need to show that. Uh, is the region balancing against China? Um, these are defense spending increases since 2014 as a percentage. Uh, now notice, look to the right, the absolute levels are minuscule, right? But of course, we haven't added South Korea and Japan in here. Uh, if we had a South Korea and Japan in here, uh, they'd get to look pretty equal, and then if we had the US, uh, resources in Japan, South Korea, Guam, Singapore, uh, China's defense bank would, would look very big. Um, in fact, again, what, what makes the Singapore case so fascinating is, is that uh, here we're predicting that Singapore will become part of Chinese hegemony, and yet there is a U.S. naval presence in Singapore every day, 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, often a, a aircraft carrier rotating through a very, very close defense relations with the United States. Um, and where do, where do countries get their arms from? I mean, the U.S. dominates except in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. And Myanmar was a one-off. Um, and of course the quantities except for the top countries are very, very small. Um, okay. That's the end. So why don't I just make a, a summary statement that uh, you know, what, what, is doing, what is doing discourse and national identity work give us? Why do we care about identity relations? Well, because it allows us to give a much more granular, specific analysis of the consequences of material power. How is material power understood as threatening or not? And uh, this, doing this kind of work allows us to differentiate among countries rather than treating every country as if it's responding identically to the same material environment. It has the same material environment, but it understands the material environment differently. I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ted. Uh, now the floor is open. Maybe someone wants to ask a question. Something was unclear. Yeah. Uh, do you see this possibility that uh, those uh, neighboring countries around China will kind of uh, build up? Uh, kind of the common identification against China because China is becoming uh, more and more like a colonial power in the area. Yeah, well, this is one of the odd, I don't know, odd findings. See, I, I do international relations, right? So, and, so we think that other countries matter to other countries. But if you looked at, if you looked at the Indonesia slide I showed you, were there any other countries? in their top 10, 15 identity categories? No. There's very, other countries have very low salience on a daily basis for masses and elites when talking about the world. Because they're so large? Well, no, but, no because it's, it's, just not, it's just not a salient thing. I mean, most countries think about themselves, their past, their history, um, okay. their, uh, their own features. And then every once in a while, 
another becomes salient. So you saw that like anti-imperial Japan became salient in, in 2015. And that could be an artifact of the fact that it's the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Um, although, you know, the person who did South Korea is actually doing her dissertation on South Korean national identity. And uh, she finds that, you know, South Korean high school history textbooks have hundreds of negative references to Japan. So that's perdoring. I mean, every year, South Korean masses are exposed to that understanding of Japan. Um, so that's not going away, and it's very salient. I mean, it's, not, it's the number one endemic category in, in South Korea is anti-Japan, right? It swamps everything else. Um, but I, 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 like, I like your idea of this. I mean, because it's interesting, cause, okay, so we're going back to 1950, right? And one of the interesting things about 1950 discourse of national identity in the countries we've looked at is how almost all of them are anti-communist, right? So there was a moment, in 1950 at least, where because of the perceived Soviet threat, communism was seen as a, anti-communism was like a supranational shared identity among the great powers, which weren't the Soviet Union and China, right? But by 1960, this virtually disappeared except in the United States. So you could, I mean, it only, it was, a, it, was a, it was an episode, and then it ameliorated over time, it dissipated over time. So there wasn't like an anti-communist coalition in the world uh, by 1960. So one, I mean, maybe it could happen, it could happen that an anti-Chinese identity arises <clears throat> in the region, but it's not evident yet. Okay. Uh, I <clears throat> I'll fill in the I I'll, I'll, I'll be filling in the pauses uh, breaks. Um, why do you think that uh, the countries that are close ideologically would be less likely to fight, hmm. while uh, the opposite may also be a prediction? Uh, hmm. uh, because they feel close, they can compete for these kind of positions. Yeah. I mean, this, of course, goes to the issue of the Sino-Soviet split, right? Where, mm -hmm. yeah. by 1958, I mean, both China and the Soviet Union understood themselves as being in the vanguard of socialist transformation of the globe, mm -hmm. but they understood it differently. And the reason why it matters is because China was powerful too, right? Uh, so I think it's, it's the material power plus the ideological closeness that allows you to hypothesize that it might go either way. But when a country doesn't have that kind of ideological power, it doesn't have that kind of material power, it's more likely to be swamped to by speak the ideational the the okay. affinity, yeah. I mean, that, that's our hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could point out Albania as an exception. You know, Albania held out, despite being incredibly weak, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay. But no, you're, you're, you're right, of course. The narcissism of small differences, but also the, the struggle for control over the, the movement. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question. Uh, my name is Ivan, and my, my question concerns uh, the identity approach uh, that you used. Uh, there are some critics of uh, social constructivism and in between social constructivism approach that say that identity is a two way concept that is uh, too loosely used and uh, the relations between identities and interests are unspecified. And my question is, what would you answer to this? That, for example, if elites can manipulate uh, social opinion, uh, popular opinion, just um, and in a way change their identities, just like that, uh, why should we use this concept at all? Hmm. And, yeah, this okay. is the question. Yeah, I mean, this is fabulous questions, of course. Um, if the elites can manipulate opinion, why does it matter? Well, I guess we, I guess we need to know I mean, it's an empirical question you're asking. We need to know, well, how frequently do elites manipulate public opinion with respect to foreign countries? I mean, we're kind of like stuck in the present, so we're seeing it, right? We're seeing Russia and Georgia and Russia and Ukraine. We're seeing the U or Trump trying to manipulate attitudes toward other countries in the United States, you know, the European allies being freeloaders and this and that. We're watching it. But um, from a social constructive perspective, we're not so much interested in the kind of epi the episodic um, assertion of agency by elites as we are in the um, 
the mass day-to-day -day quotidian production of structures of identities at home, right, that will then apply, that, that, that actually anchor and constrain the elite's capacity. I mean, no one thinks that a, or very, very few people think that elites can just make up stories about others that then resonate with a population that understands the world differently. Yeah, they can. The Ukrainian case mm -hmm. in 2014 mm -hmm. was totally made up. Mm -hmm. But it worked well. But what, what, but what, do we, what do we know about mass Russian understandings of Ukraine today, as opposed to simple, like we have indirect measures of mass Russian support for Russian policy toward Ukraine. But has there been a transformation of mass Russian understandings of Russian identity vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? Yes. We, we know that? Yes, there is research on that. It's now changing with Zelensky. It's changing back. Ah, so okay. maybe it was unstable. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. How yeah, no, the, the, there was a huge uh, uh, peak of uh, anti-Ukrainian feelings. So let's, let's, let's go back to your first part of your question, that there's no clear relationship between identity and interest. Um, well, I mean, constructionists argue that identities imply interests, right? So, for example, um, it's hard to explain German interests in Israel without understanding Germans' identification against the Holocaust, right? And indeed, you can't really explain German relations with Arab countries in general without understanding Germany's relationship with the Holocaust. I mean, Germany for, good God, decades has forgone literally billions of dollars of revenue in Arab countries, right, by forswearing arms sales. I mean, it could be a dominant player in the Middle Eastern arms market, and yet it doesn't do it. Well, we're, so I mean, that, that seems to go contrary to the material interest. But it's not, from a constructivist point of view, it's not contrary to their interest at all, because they already understand themselves in a peculiar way vis-a-vis -vis Israel, such that sales of arms to Arabs would be against German interests. It would be against German self-understanding. But at the same right? time, you know, Germany is one of the biggest donors to Palestine. Uh, yeah, the European Union, so they do it indirectly. All right. Mm -hmm. So... Slava had a question? Yes, well, first of all, thank you, Ted, for bringing back our nightmares. Uh, I... Which nightmares are those? Well, sitting at the computer, going through all those thousands of codes, uh, all those <laughs> pluses and minuses and little things, uh, that was a wonderful time. Um, <laughs> No, I, I just wanted to intervene on the Ukraine thing. First of all, the, I think there is a certain dimension of uh, popular attitudes which are connected to the memory of the Second World War, which are important and have mm. been uh, kind of involved in, in by the propaganda. And also uh, the research that you have in mind are probably opinion polls. We don't yeah. really know much about uh, the kind of deeper structures and right. more, more uh, articulated opinions about Ukraine, uh, and, and, and that's something that still needs to be done. But I agree that actually other countries matter very little, and Ukraine matter very little prior to 2014 for Russian national identity, or even within the Soviet national identity for the uh, uh, small thing. But what I wanted to ask actually is about testing. Because one, one way of testing uh, your hypothesis would be to go back in, in the past. Uh, you've done it already. Uh, but mostly using the Cold War material, mm -hmm. Cold War materials and, 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 and uh, things around the Soviet Union, China, and so on. And that, you can say that that's a special situation right, because of the bipolar world and things like that. But generally speaking, how much do you think, how many cases we might have eventually if we go back into the past, and can we go back into the past using this method? Because how much you can recover a national identity or mass views of national identity? from the 19th century. Is there even a national identity uh, in that sense? Yeah. Well, this is our plan, right? I mean, our next stage is to go from 1900 to 1940. Um, I mean, our, our plan is to have uh, meetings and conferences and workshops with cultural and um, social historians of the great powers from 1900 to 1940 to find out how the masses consumed their culture. Um, I mean, I, I can't prejudge what we're going to find. I mean, I do think you're, you're right that, for example, I mean, even in 1950, Sergei Vucetis finds in UK 
there's still an imperial identity that isn't. I mean, when we say national identity, all we care about is how people understand themselves, how people understand what, what is you, what is UK, how, what is the Great Britain, what is the UK, right? And if people say, oh, we're imperial, that becomes part of the national identity, even though it's not national in the kind of the narrow, nominal sense, but it is what that country is, right? And what we Brits are, we're, we Brits are imperial or colonialists or whatever. Um, so I suspect that as we go back in time, it'll be more and more imperial identities would be a more salient identity, uh, right, than have been in the past. And then long, long ago, um, Jennifer Mitson pointed out to me that given her work on um, the Congress of Vienna and the aftermath with the Greek Civil War and so forth, um, I mean, she, <laughs> I mean, she told me that she'd be shocked if I found any elite identification with one's own country, right? Because in those days, elites understood themselves transnationally. So there was like, we European, we civilized powers. I, I mean, even the people who were running the show were often from other countries, right? They've been parachuted in through marriages and uh, uh, great power conferences and so forth. So I think there's gonna, I think there's gonna be an expiration date on this kind of identity relation work because they're not going really to be talking about relations between countries anymore, right? Because they're already so intermingled as a transnational class of nobles and well-bred birth people who understand themselves as like running Europe um, across dynasties. I mean, so I don't, Isn't I don't, this the I don't same now? Happen. Like in the European Union, there is a cross-national elite who go to the same fine. same universities. They rotate in the European institutions. Well, we have a, we have an empirical test of that by looking at the discourse in each of these countries and finding out that they don't understand themselves that way. Um, European as a, an identity for a country certainly comes up, but it's not the most salient. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, France. I mean, France. France, France national identity as a cultural power is far more salient than France as European, for example. Um, this mean doesn't exist, just not as salient. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I wondered uh, if you looked uh, more closely uh, to the US uh, since. Um, in the table, from the table, we could uh, learn that uh, the U.S. has uh, both uh, the U.S. elites and the masses have an ambivalent uh, attitude towards neoliberalism. And yet, histor uh, historically, we know that uh, the U.S.A. Uh, has led uh, this neoliberal movement, uh, and uh, it launched uh, such institu institutions like uh, the World Bank and mm. the National Monetary Fund. And yet, uh, the elites and the masses are both are ambiguous. Uh, so, how could you explain this phenomenon? And uh, do you think that uh, this attitude uh, changes when uh, whether the uh, elites are democratic or republican? Mm. Uh, again, a very good question. Um, unfortunately, we haven't completed our reports on the United States from 1950 to the present. There's still two missing. Uh, but you're referring to the table for 2010. Uh, and of course, again, in, in that year, um, the US is fundamentally polarized between the Obama wing of American discourse that wants a more market with a human face approach to the financial crisis versus those who want you know, the same neoliberal orthodoxy as got, us, got the United States into the mess in the first place. So it's really, it's not even, it, there is not a discord, there's not an, a, an elite discourse of national identity in the United States. There are two very, very finely balanced discourses of national identity in the United States um, that articulate themselves very clearly in different media. So for example, we, um, in our sampling for the US in 2010, we do high school history textbooks, right? That's part of the uh, identity terrain. Uh, but in the U.S., I mean, you think, first of all, in the U.S., we have, I don't know, 130,000, 140,000 school boards. Each school board chooses their own high school history textbook. 
So you think, oh my God, how can you possibly sample that? Then there must be thousands of different textbooks. Well, no, because it turns out that the California school board and the Texas school board buy so many millions of textbooks each year that they dominate the market. So most other school boards around the country just choose either Texas or California. Well, as you might infer, Texas has one version of the United States and California has another. <laughs> and that tracks perfectly with the split, let's say, between the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, which are the two newspapers that we mm. chose. So Texas is conservative and California is So if you read a Texas, Texas textbook, you'd think slavery never happened, Na Native <laughs> Americans never were slaughtered and uh, had genocide committed, that the civil rights movement didn't occur. I mean, it's just like this completely whitewashed, literally whitewashed version of, of American history of nothing but like from triumph to triumph to triumph with the market providing all benefits and democracy had been perfected in 1776, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, the California textbook, it's all about affirmative action, minorities, multiculturalism, the struggle of workers for unionization, uh, you know, all of the flaws of the United States, all the problems that exist, all the struggle to overcome. I mean, it's like Obama's textbook, right? Um, so it's, it, the US is a really, really tough case. I mean, the, no other country, at least in 2010, was so obviously polarized into two different countries. Uh, than the U.S. was in uh, 2010. Uh, but if you take just two books, two bestsellers, how can you judge? Maybe these two books are from the same ideology, mm -hmm. and then you are totally missing the the other half of the country. Yeah, we haven't we haven't had an ideological problem with novels yet. Um, the problem with coding novels is is that um, they're so well the they're the least explicit about national identity of any source. Well, movies too, for that matter. So for example, when uh, Japan 2010, the best-selling novel is Murakami's IQ 84, which is about 1,800 pages long. And I read it, and I couldn't find any Japanese national identity in it. Until I stepped back and realized, this entire book is about Japan, right? And it turned, I mean, essentially the, the author is telling us that you know, Japanese are too, the Japanese are too um, traditionalist religiously, too traditional sexually, too traditionalist in terms of gender. So the whole book was like a critique of Japanese national identity and laying out an aspiration for Japan to be different, right? As opposed to, I mean, I don't think the word Japan or Japanese even appeared in the book. So when you're coding novels, you have to be, you have to step back and see, well, what's the good life being presented here? What are the qualities of the, the positive heroes and the negative heroes in the book, right? What's being criticized? What's being praised? Um, and mov movies are even more difficult in the sense that, I mean, hmm, we give you a case from China. So in China, 2010, um, during the discourse analysis, this, the, the author pointed out that, um, that she had taken up, so the, the, the number one movie is about a, uh, a Chinese woman from the countryside, from the provinces, who goes to um, Shanghai and joins a Western multinational corporation as a kind of a junior executive or administrator. And the books, it, so the books all about the tension between you know what she left behind, what she wants to become, the difference between Westerners and Chinese. Um, and one, so there's a lot of there's a lot of dialogue, there's a lot of good identity stuff in there. But one interesting aspect of the identity that the author recovered was the fact that. Um, whenever uh, this woman ate, this aspiring westernized woman, it's always traditional Chinese cuisine. She never ate any Western food, right? So in this sense, it's reproducing this traditional Chinese identity for her uh, in all contexts, right? Despite the tension that she was feeling um, about becoming westernized. Or music, the French films. Both French films from 2010 are pretty anti-American, anti-capitalist, and yet both soundtracks are exclusively American rock and roll, including going to the beach, turning on the radio in your cabana and having to have American rock and roll. Right? So there's this hegemonic soundscape. From this, right. which we can just infer that most uh, best-selling novels are nationalist in this or that way, which seems true to me. They're about the nation. They would be uh, referring to symbols 
uh, with, which are unique to this country and which the readers would identify with, maybe even differentially, as opposed to American novels that they would read in translation. Right. This is, this is Ray, William, Ray Williams' argument about the novel, is that uh, novelists, first of all, want to be read. Duh. And then you say, well, that's not always the case. I mean, a lot of postmodern novels they don't give a shit about how many readers they have, right? I mean, as long as they have a thousand good readers, they don't care. But in general, if you're a best-selling novelist, you want to be read. How, what's the first step to being read, Ray Williams says? Be understood, right? You have to write stuff in a language that the masses understand. How do you do that? Well, by choosing symbols, um, events, people, personages, practices, cultural um, moments that everyone, that the masses get and resonate with, right? So in a really weird sense, uh, Ray Williams writes, in a really weird sense, um, novelists are like ethnographers, right? They're deliberately trying to find out what's commonsensical among a population such that when I write this, I'm going to have the biggest possible audience. Now, this is true with best self. This is funny. This is why, um, you know, when doing discourse analysis on national identity, you, you end up reading a lot of trashy <laughs> novels, right? Because those are the most popular, but those are also the ones that are most commonsensically uh, resonant with uh, the mass discourse of national identity in the country. Okay. You have a question? Good. In countries where there's like heavy state control of media, for example, China, how do, for example, in movies disentangle views that are being pushed on the population by the elites and things that are actually reflective of the general population? For example, um, a common theme in Chinese movies is like the evil Japanese colonialist. Do you see this as a reflection of the views of the Chinese populace? Or do you think this could also be the Chinese state trying to press a certain view on the yeah. population. That's really tough. You know, people, I'm sure you know her work, but I mean, Jessica Chen Weiss, she, she's, she's at Cornell. She's written a book recently on exactly this question. How much is, how much of anti, Japan, how much of anti-Japanese Chinese nationalism is generated from below and how much of it is uh, from the elite? I mean, I, so I'd ask you just to read her book. She has far more data than I do, but from Jessica Chen Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, -E -E -S, Jessica Chen Weiss. Now that book has been criticized too. In fact, you're, you're gonna find the reviews of it will refer to other work, but anyway, if you're really interested in this, there is a literature trying to get it, and um, there's a literature trying to get at this, and you know who's done crazily huge, um, large data on this is Gary King at Harvard, who knows nothing about China, but he's, he's into uh, big data, right? So he's like scraped millions of pages of Chinese uh, chat rooms and come up with a statistical model to differentiate between exactly your question, where is it coming from? How is it generated, right? You should check out his stuff as well, Gary King. But as far as my work is concerned, um, the way I think about it is um, longitudinally, right? As long as we're able to like do China over time, we'll be able to see whether or not stuff emerges in the mass discourse before or after it emerged in the elite discourse. So probably my favorite example here, which actually is pretty good, is in 2010 discourse analysis, one of the most salient categories of Chinese identity among the masses was that China is corrupt and it's bad. That was virtually non-existent in the elite discourse. Hmm. Two years later, Xi Jinping comes to power fighting corruption, right? So there's a perfect example of where the masses were ahead of the elites, right? At least explicitly. And now in 2015, you look at uh, elite discourse in China, um, that China's corrupt is near the top in 2015 among elite Chinese, just you know, five years after it wasn't there at all. So I mean, there's some cases that you can watch, uh, but uh, you never, I, I don't, you know, Jessica Chen Weiss and these others, I mean, they have a, you know, this is their top, this is their intellectual agenda, is it fair? Because it's such an important question, right? Um, how much can, and we were talking about earlier, right? How much can elites manipulate nationalist feelings or anti X country feelings? Can they just create that a whole cloth? Does it already have to be there in, in, in some other form? Can they turn it on and off? 
I mean, some people think that you know China, the Chinese leadership just uses like a faucet and turns it on and off whenever they want, right? Uh, and others, like, like for example, um, Peter Greece thinks that it's it's completely the opposite. And in fact, the leaks, the Chinese leaks are constantly trying to control it, right? That it's so out of control that they actually need to clamp down on anti-Japanese uh, feelings, um, as opposed to uh, you know, trying to gin it up. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? If there are no questions, let's thank uh, Ted. Thank you.